Um, uh, Dr. Nadeem, are you back? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is um, the volume that's going to be audible to you. This is uh, the one that I'm going to be managing. Is this okay? This is perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right, we are live on YouTube. Should we start? Should I share my screen now? Just a minute, I'll, I'll just help you out one second. Are, are you ready? Should we start? I can, yeah. Uh, just one minute, please. Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 15N, which is Hematology Erythrocytic Disorder. We are streaming live from PGI Chandigarh. And a very interesting and a very pertinent topic for the day, Quantitative Disorders of Globin Chain. This is session one. And to speak on that, we have Dr. Prashant Sharma. He is an MBBS, MD and DNB from Delhi University. DM Hematopathology from AIMS New Delhi the DRC path is right now the additional professor in hematology department at PGI Chandigarh with research interest which includes disorders of red cells, erythropoiesis and lab laboratory instrumentation. He's also the associate editor of the Indian Journal of Hematology and Blood Transfusion since 2013. With more than 150 national and international publications, he enjoys gardening, running and reading. Before I ask Dr. Sharma to start, let me request all of you Please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request Dr. Sharma, sir, please share your screen. Let's start. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nadeem. And um, let me first just check if I'm audible, my slides are visible, and are they in slideshow? Yeah, your slides are perfectly visible and you are perfectly audible. Just press that hide pop-up so that that goes away. Okay, yeah. thanks. Now you can start, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And um, at the very outset, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on this forum. Um, I'm Prashant Sharma, like uh, I was just told, and my topic today is quantitative disorders of globin chain. So we're going to be covering this in two parts, and uh, because simply because it is such a mouthful of a topic, and today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some normal hemoglobin structures and function, uh, how we name these disorders, how we classify them, and then we'll spend uh, some amount of time on beta thalassemia in various headings. The remaining part, uh, as thalassemia, HPFH and unstable hemoglobins which are also quantitative disorders we will be discussing subsequently on another day. So hemoglobin disorders go back a long way and virtually as long back as humanity itself really. About 10,000 years ago um, this is a terracotta skull which is now in France but was initially recovered from Turkey and this you can see the typical porotic hyperostosis that's going on in the skull. And um, 
Yeah, so there has been some doubt, debate amongst uh, archaeologists and uh, archaeohematologists, if there's something like that, about whether, what it really represents. But the consensus is that this is probably a, a, a hyper uh, proliferative anemia, uh, most consistent with a thalassemia major. And then, of course, uh, we are aware of the uh, fact noted by Haldane that a lot of these disorders of red cells um, show a striking similarity in distribution with areas that are endemic for malaria. So uh, that's another reason why um, they've been uh, around for so long, because the heterozygous state uh, affords some protection against the more severe forms of malaria. And this gentleman over here uh, is Thomas Cooley. Uh, he, was a, uh, he was an American uh, pediatrician who also worked a lot in France. And he was the one who first gave us detailed descriptions of what was till then called Mediterranean anemia. And he um, uh, suggested the name of erythroblastic anemia for obvious reasons. So, um, again, these are disorders that um, have been uh, having their own share of uh, limelight. These disorders, unfortunately, disproportionately affect the lower and the middle income countries of the world. And this is a picture from Bangladesh, where uh, these are children with E-beta thalassemia, one of the most common causes of uh, uh, non-transfusion dependent thalassemia worldwide uh, on uh, the World uh, Thalassemia Day. So when we're talking about these, it's important to be clear about the nomenclature that we're using. So when we say thalassemias, remember that this is a reduced production of a structurally normal globin chain. So the reduction could be in alpha globin, beta globin, or both the delta and beta globins. But at the end of the day, these are quantitative disorders. And then we have something called the hemoglobinopathies. Hemoglobinopathies are disorders resulting from production of an abnormal globin and this results in the production of a variant hemoglobin. So examples are hemoglobin S, C, D, J, Merit, etc. So unlike thalassemias, these are qualitative disorders which means that you can try to detect the abnormal of the variant hemoglobin by hemoglobin HPLC or electrophoresis. And then you have disorders which straddle the two worlds. These are the thalassemic hemoglobinopathies. And examples of these are hemoglobin E, Lepore, and constant spring. And there's an Indian variant called hemoglobin coiadora. Uh, all of these disorders in the last point are characterized by reduced production as well as the production of a variant hemoglobin. So they are hybrids. Now, these disorders together are extremely common if one takes into account the heterozygous state. So, according to one uh, respectable estimate, about 5% of the world's population has at least one thalassemia variant allele. So, when you have 5% of the population walking around as heterozygotes, they're going to be marrying each other and you will begin to get compound uh, heterozygotes as well as homozygotes. And if within the uh, early years of the 21st century, we expect just short of a million individuals with clinically significant disease to be born. And believe it or not, the majority of these are likely to be in the hugely populous South Asia as well as southern China regions of the world. So these are disorders which are autosomal recessive, which means that the parents are going to be carriers in virtually all the situations. The parents are themselves going to be asymptomatic, so they will not know that they have a serous hemoglobinopathy, the potential to transmit a serous hemoglobinopathy until they have an affected child. There are exceptions to the autosomal recessive rule, and these are unstable hemoglobins and dominant beta thalassemias that we will deal with somewhere along the way, either today or next time. This, the intriguing part about why there is the, the, these disorders have reached such high frequencies, you know, if something is deleterious, then the, over time evolution tends to weed that particular trait out. So the reason why these disorders not just persist, but thrive at what are really polymorphic frequencies is the fact that they confer genetic resistance to falciparum malaria. And how do they exert this genetic resistance? This is because 
of several, uh, so this is because of several reasons which I'll just come to, but this is not just limited to the thalassemias. This is also seen in the hemoglobinopathies, a wide range of them, as well as thal, membrane defects like Southeast Asian ovalocytosis and some forms of eleprocytosis, variant blood groups and glyco variant glycophorins can lead to resistance to malaria and G6PD deficiency has is also well known to be associated with it. And all uh, G6PD deficiency is a disorder that's also very common in the um, in our country as well as the other places where thalassemia is common. So how does it work? So what are the mechanisms by which erythrocytic resistance is provided to falciparum malaria by thal? We can't go into detail, but there's been a lot of research on this, and it is partly because of decreased merozoite entry, uh, resistance to intracellular growth of the parasite. There's a reduced lysis of the erythrocyte at the end of parasite maturation, so the merozoites don't get released. And there's an increased phagocytosis of thalassemic parasite-infected RBCs. There is decreased adherence of infected RBCs to other cells, and they, which we know is one of the major pathogenetic features of falciparum malaria. And there is an increased immune response to malarial infection, possibly because of exposure of new antigens, new antigens on the red cell surface. And there's a lot of epidemiological as well as in um, vitro evidence for each of these mechanisms. But coming back to the thalassemias proper, uh, before we study a disease, we need to classify it. So we can classify thalassemias into subtypes based on the precise chain that is underproduced. So alpha thalassemia, beta thalassemia, delta beta thalassemia and gamma delta beta thalassemias are the most clinically significant ones in this group. Their frequencies, of course, are different. On the other hand, gamma... Uh, gamma and epsilon varieties, so these are also um, non-alpha chains, these varieties are not clinically significant beyond early infancy simply because by that time they should have been replaced by beta chains. So if somebody has an inherited underproduction of the gamma chain, they are going to be anemic uh, as neonates but they will slowly get better. The other way to classify uh, thalassemias is according to the extent of the defect in the individual chains. So, this is well known, we can have beta naught or beta plus or there should be another plus here, sorry, a beta plus plus kind of a situation where you have either no production of any globin, you have some production of a normal globin and in a beta plus plus state you have a reasonably large amount of beta globin although it is still less than what should have been normal. The other way these mutations can be classified is actually on the basis of what has happened genetically. So one can have missense mutations, insertions, deletions, indels and so on. In beta thalassemia, the defects are usually one of these four types. Rarely thalassemias can be acquired and this is true for both beta and alpha but most of the acquired thalassemias are alpha thalassemias and these are almost always associated with MDS and rarely a myeloproliferative neoplasm. The classification of thales beta thalassemia that we use most often however is the one which is a clinical based and in this the most severe form of the disease is called transfusion dependent beta thalassemia or TDT. This was previously known as beta thalassemia major and most of these patients are going to be homozygous for a severe mutation. So a combination of beta naught beta naught or a combination of beta naught beta plus. These people are going to require lifelong blood transfusions to sustain life and if we don't transfuse them, then they are going to be dying within the first five years or so of their life. Then we have a group of patients. These are less common than the transfusion dependent ones and these are called non-transfusion dependent thalassemias. Previously, they were called thalassemia intermedia. Now, these patients are symptomatic, but the key difference from TTT is that they do not require repeated transfusions to sustain life. So, they may require intermittent transfusions, but they should not be dependent on that so to simply survive. And although blood trans requirements are lower, these patients are not asymptomatic, remember. They may still develop complications, especially iron overload and extramedullary hematopoiesis.
and then at the extreme other end of the disorder we have people who are heterozygous and sometimes you will uh, see them being called carriers or th beta thalassemia traits so these are all synonymous terms they are asymptomatic for the most part and uh, and that's because these are autosomal recessive disorders so both copies of the gene uh, need to be uh, both the alleles need to be affected however they are still of genetic importance because they serve as reservoirs of the disease and if they marry another carrier they can transmit the disease so for those of you who are interested now today we're going to be sticking just to the um, postgraduate level but there's been a lot of interesting research on beta thalassemia carriers and their microcytic hypochromic rbcs have some special properties which unlike the transfusion dependent thalassemias make them more resistant to thrombosis and some other advantages that these uh, traits have so you could read up about it that it's not just malaria but uh, and the trade off for a low uh, slightly lower hemoglobin and abnormal indices is there for thal traits now the primary event that happens in the symptomatic um, thalassemias is a globin chain imbalance so what happens in both beta and alpha thalassemia is that the impaired production of one type of globin chain is going to cause an imbalance in what is otherwise a very finely controlled alpha to beta chain ratio this is normally kept at 1 plus minus 0 0.05 but obviously if there's an underproduction the opposite chain is going to increase in number relative number so while the alpha 2 beta 2 tetramer which means the adult hemoglobin is a highly soluble molecule but single chains or their dimers and tetramers tend to precipitate adjacent to the rbc membrane and this uh, phenomenon is worse for alpha tetramers than it is for beta tetramers so what it means is that for an equivalent genetic defect the beta thalassemia with an excess of alpha chains is going to be clinically worse beta globin production usually begins by uh, about the last three to four weeks of pregnancy and it abruptly increases after birth so at birth he, adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin are roughly um, um, uh, competing for dominance but by six months of age the adult hemoglobin has taken over and which is why we observe that patients with beta thalassemia major tend to present at around six months to one year of age because their hemoglobin f has declined so this again is of practical importance therapeutic importance because many of the efforts which are aimed at correcting thalassemia at a gene level are actually aimed at reinducing hbf because uh, if it comes back it should be able to take over the function of the missing adult hemoglobin the beta chain so what are the effects on the erythrocyte the major effect of the unpaired chains on the erythrocytes are the oxidative uh, effects of oxidative injury and that's because the unpaired chains which have an attached heme are going to be susceptible to oxidation so these oxidized alpha chains in beta thalassemia are partly proteolized to form iron containing uh, hemichrome pigments and which are basically peptide fragments which are highly reactive what they do the hemichromes uh, act as fenton reagents and they generate ROS and then we all know that the ROS is going to oxidize all the uh, structures in the membrane pro uh, in the membrane that they come in contact with whether it's lipid or uh, proteins or even DNA so this is uh, a diagram where uh, we can see the uh, various effects of the membrane bound uh, uh, globin chains which have uh, precipitated and what happens is ultimately there's a generation of various kinds of free radicals in addition there is generation of free uh, iron and that again is extremely toxic in the cytosol a part of it is converted to methemoglobin that has its own problems and we ultimately end up having not just the oxidative part of uh, damage but the ensuing non-oxidative damage as well so what happens to the red cell membrane when we have a partially oxidized alpha globin chain which is binding to the membrane skeleton it, the first thing it will do is disrupt phospholipid bilayer asymmetry and those of you who are uh, familiar with the pathogenesis of apoptosis would realize that really this is an invitation for the cell to undergo intramedullary cell death so we're talking about the um, red cell precursors if their phospholipids are getting exposed it's been observed that thalassemic erythroblasts as well as red cells have abnormal cytoskeletal composition. 
there is an increase in band 3 and with clustering of band 3, so which is normally an aging related change, there is a decrease in spectrin and chirin and band 4.1, again an aging related change. There is an increase in rigidity in alpha thalassemia and there is an increased in, increase in friability and instability of the red cell membrane in beta thalassemia. There is also abnormal hydration of the red cell by which we mean that the ratio of water to hemoglobin and other solutes in the cell is uh, altered. The beta thal red blood cells are dehydrated whereas the alpha thalassemia red blood cells are relatively hyperhydrated and this leads, but either way it leads to decreased deformability and increased removal by the spleen. So, why do these patients have anemia? Well, the answer lies both in the bone marrow as well as the peripheral blood. In the bone marrow, we have ineffective erythropoiesis, which uh, means that the red cell precursors are undergoing apoptosis as well as phagocytosis. And this is because of exposure of, phos of phosphatidyl serine as well as abnormal antigens as well as decreased sialic acid and the formation of anti neo antigen antibodies against the uh, erythroid precursors. On the other hand, the red cells in uh, circulation in beta thalassemia have a survival time only one third that of normal RBCs. And there is also increased cytokine production. These cells normally act, uh, normally red cells act as cytokine sinks, which means that they mop up the immune response by removing cytokines. But in the case of thalassemia, the uh, cytokines like increased TNF actually end up activating monocytes and macrophages, making them more phagocytic. So, with that basic background of pathogenesis, let's move to the next step of pathogenesis. And the, uh, the underlying uh, uh, observation behind this next part of the talk is the fact that even thalassemia patients with the same genotype don't always behave clinically, that is, they don't have the same phenotype. Or another way of putting it is that thalassemia is a monogenic disorder, but clinically it often behaves as a polygenic defect. And that is because in addition to the beta globin gene defect, other genetic modifiers also come into play. So let's start with what are primary modifiers. Primary modifiers are the original beta thal mutation that a patient has inherited. So these can range from null or beta naught mutations, which uh, I already told you are complete abs characterized by complete absence of beta globin production, to those that cause only a minimal deficit, that is the beta plus plus mutation. So these are uh, the when you have beta th the beta thalassemia mutations are typically a single base substitution or a minor insertion or deletion of a few bases. This normally happens within the gene or within its splicing sites or in its immediate flanking sequences, the five prime or three prime UTRs. Remember that these uh, mutations may affect any level of genetic regulation, that is the beta globin gene transcription, its post-translational uh, processing of its pre-mRNA or the translation of its mRNA into protein. And this is the major reason why we have such a lot of heterogeneity in the final effect. So the five commonest beta thalassemia mutations in India are the IVS15G2C, the IVS11 uh, G2T, these are both mutations that affect splice sites. Then we have two frame shifts, a codon 89 and a codon 4142. Sometimes you will see them written as frame shift 89 and frame shift 4142, they are the same. This is a single nucleotide insertion and this is a four nucleotide deletion. We have one uh, medium sized, let's say, deletion happening in beta thalassemia as well. The 619 base pair deletion is common amongst the western parts, uh, people from the western parts of India and uh, it's in many studies it's the second most common uh, mutation that is found. Less common mutations include codon 15, codon 16, a mutation called cap plus 1 and another one called minus 88 and some of these we will discuss when we talk about specific features of different mutations. Moving on to secondary modifiers, now these are loci that affect the alpha to beta globin chain imbalance or the degree of HBF response. So in a way the degree of HBF response is also influencing the alpha beta globin chain imbalance because it's providing an alternative to the beta chain. But starting first with the alpha globin genotype, it's been noticed that those patients with beta thalassemia major, uh, major or transfusion dependent thalassemia who co-inherit alpha gene deletions 
especially if they get more than one, have an ameliorating effect on their phenotype, which means that they get better. And that is expected because we know that alpha chains are one of the major villains in beta thalassemia. On the other hand, um, if somebody has a co-inherited alpha chain alpha gene triplication or quadruplication, they, this tends to exacerbate beta thalassemia of all types. So let's see specific examples. Patients who have homozygous beta not thalassemia, that is they are expected to be transfusion dependent, but they co-inherit HBH disease. So again, a lot of it will be clearer once we talk the next time. HBH disease, have, patients have only one functioning alpha gene. These patients end up becoming thal intermediates or non-transfusion dependent thalassemia phenotypically because they don't have that many alpha globin chains to now precipitate. On the other hand, if somebody is a beta thalassemia trait, but he has inherited a defect where there is an increased alpha globin product. So again, it will be clear next time how sometimes the same mutations that can give, the same deletions that can give rise to um, alpha um, uh, thalassemia can give rise to triplicated uh, or quadruplicated alpha globin genes in another allele. Um, so if somebody inherits this sort of a genotype and has a beta thalassemia trait, they will become symptomatic. So they will usually end up behaving like a non-transfusion dependent thalassemia. The other secondary modifier is a variant in fetal hemoglobin production. And that's because, increased, that's because increased fetal hemoglobin can reduce the ratio of alpha to non-alpha globins. How does it do that? Because simply it pro, uh, there are uh, genetic uh, uh, polymorphisms that can increase gamma globin production even beyond infancy. And once that happens, they can uh, combine with some of the alpha chains and reduce the uh, dyserythropoiesis and ineffective erythropoiesis going on in the bone marrow. One of the most prominent uh, uh, polymorphisms in this regard is the XMN1 G gamma polymorphisms. Uh, polymorphism. This is present in the uh, G gamma gene and uh, it explains about one third of the genetic variance within the level of HBF. And more recently, other loci have also been discovered. So the HBS1L and MIB, these are two genes and in their intergenic region are many polymorphic sites which can um, uh, influence HBF levels. And in addition, in BCL11A also, there are multiple polymorphisms and depending on, on what a patient has inherited, they may be lucky enough for their HBF levels to go up. And then there are tertiary modifiers. So what are these? These are loci that are not involved in globin synthesis or imbalance, but they modify the progression and complications of the disease. So how do they work? For instance, the iron overloading in beta thalassemia, and we'll see that this is one of the major consequences of the lifelong transfusions that these patients require. This is predisposed to in Western populations by uh, mut uh, mutations in the HFE gene, or sometimes people can call them polymorphisms because they are present in a very large proportion of people. And then again, bone disease in thalassemia. These patients have osteoporosis and osteopenia. This is influenced by polymorphisms in transforming growth factor beta 1, the vitamin D receptor, and the collagen genes. In addition, the risk of heart failure, this is one of the leading causes of death in these patients, is influenced by the allele, um, uh, by the genotype of apolipoprotein E that the patient has inherited. There are specific HLA alleles that affect the tendency to hepatitis and liver cirrhosis that they have been worked on. And then again, the many, many polymorphisms that control uh, a person's prothrombotic influences also influence the tendency to thrombosis in these patients. So this is a summary diagram of the genetic modifiers of phenotype in beta thalassemia. The primary modifier of phenotype is the beta globin gene, uh, gene defect that the patient has inherited. That is the cause of his thalassemia, major or intermedia. And then we have alpha globin uh, copy number as well as fetal hemoglobin levels, which are the secondary modifiers. And they are less in importance to the primary modifier, but still of major importance. And then we have a lot of tertiary modifiers which influence specific complications. So we have the VDR, uh, estrogen receptor, collagen receptor for bone disease, HFE for iron, uh, APOE for heart failure, and UGT1A1, which is the uh, Gilbert uh, as well as Crigland IR uh, gene uh, for uh, jaundice.
so when all of this is going on the patient will finally come to the uh, clinical attention with a particular clinical manifestation a set of manifestations so in thal transfusion dependent thalassemia or thalassemia major these include very severe anemia hepatosplenomegaly jaundice pigment gallstones a plethora of skeletal changes the typical thalassemic facies characterized by uh, maxillary prominence uh, malar prominence uh, prognathism uh, and so on osteopenia osteoporosis bony masses they can have extramedullary masses pain um, growth failure changes in body habitus they will have iron overload by and by uh, inevitably endocrine and metabolic complications are rife because of iron deposition in uh, endocrine organs starting from the pituitary and manifesting as hypothyroidism hypogonadism and insulin resistance heart failure thrombosis pulmonary function abnormalities pulmonary hypertension and leg ulcers when we look at patients with non transfusion dependent thalassemia and this is uh, the these percentages are from a famous um, article because entities are more difficult to study they are more pleiotropic um, in their manifestations so these patients tend to have more incidence of osteoporosis extramedullary hematopoiesis hypogonadism cholelithiasis thrombosis pulmonary hypertension abnormal liver function leg ulcers again endocrinopathies a lower risk of heart failure that was higher up in thal major and diabetes mellitus okay so that was the pathogenesis and the clinical part and linked with that we are going to now proceed on to the genetics of beta thalassemia so um, i've been speaking for about half an hour now and maybe i can just check with dr nadeem if there are any questions in the chat box which i can't see um uh i hope uh, the previous part was coming through because i really i'm not getting any feedback um oops maybe i need to call up dr nadeem hello yeah hi oh yeah. glad to hear your voice could you hear me yeah yeah i could hear you yeah absolutely okay. fine right so this is session 1 um uh, well i'm not finished yet but i just thought i'd take a break since it's halfway yeah. and um uh, so I, I, did anybody have any questions so far There are no questions, but uh, somebody had just commented regarding the sound part. But now it is all settled, so I don't think so that there is an issue. Your sound part is absolutely fine now. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So I guess if uh, there are no questions, we'll save time and just march on relentless. Yeah. And, uh, yeah um, so you could just let me know if I am back in slideshow. Yeah, you are. Please start. thank you very much um so moving on to the genetics of beta thalassemia uh, about this let's first start with the hemoglobin the normal hemoglobin as we know that the adult hemoglobin is um, is a tetramer of alpha 2 beta 2 chains and that's why we have to call it a hetero tetramer it has four heme groups that lie in clefts on its surface and these are equal distant from each other and there's a plane of symmetry across this globin which has a single plane of symmetry The alpha globin chains are composed of 141 amino acids, and the beta globin chains are composed of 146 amino acids. At this point, I'd like to mention that these chains have an evolutionary history. They have arisen from a single common uh, uh, ancient uh, gene, which uh, went underwent gene conversion and gene duplication events, and which is why all globin genes uh, and uh, consequently the globin chains share a lot of structural homology. with each other so to this audience i'm sure it's well known that um, if adult hemoglobin was alpha 2 beta 2 then hbf is alpha 2 gamma 2 and hba2 is alpha 2 delta 2 so the gamma chains are encoded by two uh, gamma globin genes and the delta chain by a uh, delta globin gene there are some pathological variants but uh, both of these concern alpha thalassemia so i think i'll skip these in today's talk <laughs> 
So the chromosomal locations of the beta globin as well as the alpha globin gene clusters are important. When you have a gene that's arisen in a um, uh, over time by duplication, uh, you are going to have a gene family. So the beta globin gene cluster is located on chromosome 11 on its short arm, and the alpha globin gene cluster. There are two alpha globins per um, chromosome 16 of the uh, human being. So these are located one or uh, two on each arm of chromosome 16. And uh, this I've already told you that evolutionarily these genes have arisen by duplication of one another and therefore they look a lot alike on sequences. So this is a closer look at the alpha and beta globin gene clusters. So what we have going on here and uh, just focus on the image on the top at the uh, moment. This is chromosome 11, 5 prime to 3 prime. This is the uh, major uh, uh, producer, the beta globin, which is pre present most 3 prime. Then subsequently, these are the two genes which have uh, which are in play during in utero life, the G gamma and the A gamma. They are virtually copies of each other except for a nucleotide here and there. And then we have the delta globin gene which gives rise in combination with the alpha globin to HbA2 and uh, this is a gene which is hypomorphic which means it's, uh, it doesn't produce a lot of... Uh, uh, mRNA or protein and that's because of certain changes that have happened and maybe at this point I'll just mention that there's been interest in even upregulating the delta globin gene by studying exactly what is the epigenetic mechanism that um, or the uh, uh, sequence that is turning it off that who knows that if the minor hemoglobin A2 goes up then again for thal majors we may have a cure at hand. So that was beta globin. Now alpha globin cluster, we have two alpha globin genes, the alpha 2 and alpha 1. And then uh, at this point, maybe I could should mention that both in the alpha globin cluster, we have an LCR and there's another one. So in the beta, we have the LCR, which stands for the locus control region. And this is a regulatory region, which has the binding sites of a lot of transcription factors, which are going to be produced elsewhere in the genome. And they're going to come in bind here, as well as at various sites in the subsequent cluster. And there's sometimes it and, and what it happens, what it does is it loops around and they, uh, directly activates the transcription of the genes. So the uh, this activation of each of these genes proceeds sequentially through the uh, embryonic life. So first we have the epsilon, then the GNA gamma, and then uh, around 35 weeks the beta globin uh, starts to function. So moving on to the uh, gene itself, and although uh, this is the structure of the HBB or the beta globin gene, this is, remember, the general layout of all the globin genes. So we have in all of these genes two introns or coding sequences separated by three exons. Uh, sorry, uh, introns or non-coding sequences separated by three exons or coding uh, sequences. And uh, you have promoters and enhancers uh, and this is the beta globin gene which is amplified over here. Um, so, um, just a gentle reminder at this point of time that we are currently looking at the DNA sequence of this gene and the central dogma of molecular biology states that DNA is, uh, gives rise to mRNA via transcription and mRNA is translated into a protein. So, that's how it works for the majority of the genome. So, looking more closely at the beta globin gene, there are some sequences that we need to be aware of to understand how mutations can make them go awry. So, here you can see that flanking the introns are sequences which are identical. So, these are called, uh, and obviously we know that where the intron and the exon are meeting, it's going to be a, a splice site because, um, just a second. Yeah, because ultimately the uh, introns are going to be have to be um, uh, spliced out and the exons join together to give us the mRNA. So uh, a big group of uh, mutations can occur at the splice site which are identified by the invariant nucleotides and around them uh, uh, just outside are the consensus sequences. So uh, we have a spliceosomal complex which is going to be identifying these sites and if there's some problem in their identification then the mRNA is not going to be normal.
and then I would like you to focus on these motifs over here. These are upstream promoter elements, and these three are um, very well known: the Tata box, the CCA80, and the CACCC homology boxes. So these uh, localize the site of transcription initiation in the gene. And then this particular slim red line is something called the capsite. So what is a capsite? It is an N7 uh, methyl guanosine cap. Uh, so this happens uh, when this becomes the uh, first nucleotide of the pre mRNA and once this uh, methylation has happened it protects it from exonuclease cleavage and uh, it also then subsequently facilitates the pre mRNA splicing polyadenylation again uh, uh, something that is happening uh, at the tail of the mRNA uh, uh, and protects it from degrad uh, degradation and nuclear export so uh, it uh, serves to reason that if there is a mutation ha happening at the cap site even though uh, all the promoter sequences even though the sequences of the gene itself are going to be normal but we will have under production of the beta globin so uh, we already know that the molecular uh, basis of beta thalassemia predominantly is point mutations and some uh, deletions like the 6 or 9 base pair and mutations can occur any of the sites uh, any of the steps that we just discussed and the mutations depending on how much they affect the uh, how much underproduction they cause can be of these three types so let us look more closely at the uh, mechanisms so the common mechanism of thalassemia beta thalassemia is mutations that affect rna processing these are single base changes that involve these splice junctions and what they do is they abolish normal rna splicing sites and remember so we have a handful of splicing sites and if they are not going to be working okay then almost certainly we are going to have a beta not kind of a mutation so single base substitution within the consensus sequence that we just saw of the intervening sequence 1 donor site which means intron 1 this uh, uh, is a common uh, event the substitution of g in uh, position 5 with another nucleotide this re results in a severe beta plus thalassemia and in fact this is the commonest indian mutation the ivs15 Mutations can also sometimes create new splice site. So what happens is that the original splice site is undisturbed, but instead a new splice site got created by the mutation uh, at another place, which can be either in the intron or an exon. And I'll just show you an example at position uh, 110. So what happens is that if these new splice sites are more attractive to the spliceosomal complex than the original one, then they will be used preferentially. And the third way, of course, is that splice sites can get abolished. So you can get abnormally long uh, mRNA. And uh, another mechanism is activation of cryptic or alternative donor sites within uh, exon 1. So again, you're going to have abnormal splicing. Mm, and uh, yes, so uh, HBE, although this is not a part of the job entrusted to me, you remember this was a thalassemic hemoglobinopathy, and that's because there is an uh, alternative donor site which is um, created. So you'll have a variant hemoglobin, but also being produced in lesser amounts. So this is an example um, of a. Um, minus 110 mutation we can see uh, this is the ivs1 and the normal splicing will happen at these junctions on the other hand if there is the creation of a, a new uh, uh, splice site then uh, the uh, instead of this the uh, spliceosome is going to recognize this as the uh, new site from which to start the second exon so what will happen is that we will have an extra 19 base pairs included, 19 nucleotides included in the mRNA. So theoretically this may not have led to too much of a problem because uh, we could have gone on to the end of it. But what happens is that once this intronic sequence is also being taken into account, then there is a stop codon lying over here, which normally gets ignored because you know the, uh, this area would anyway get spliced out. So you have an abnormally small mRNA, which uh, is obviously of no use. Then we have mutations that can affect transcription. So these, as one can imagine, are slightly milder mutations because the mRNA at least is probably going to get formed. Uh, 
these uh, can be mutations in the promoter region, which are the three boxes uh, that we saw earlier. They can be uh, leading to the decreased binding of RNA polymerase as well as decreased rate of RNA transcription to just about 20-30% of normal. And of these, the prominent mutations are those at position minus 88 and minus 87. So, when we say minus 88 or minus 87, we mean that it is upstream of the coding sequence. So, uh, this is relative to the mRNA capsite and they are close to the uh, promoter region. And one of these mutations, the minus 88 C2T, is the commonest one found in JET6 in Punjab. It wasn't there in the top 5 list that I had shown you earlier. Okay. Then there can be mutations that cause abnormal translation of messenger RNA. These are usually nonsense mutations that can change an amino acid codon into a chain termination codon. And obviously, uh, and these are the three nonsense such as stop codons. So that is not going to be a nice thing to happen because your protein is going to stop abruptly. And this prevents further translation of the mRNA and results in beta naught thalassemia. And this can sometimes happen, uh, abnormal translation can happen because of uh, indels insertions or deletions of a nucleotide number other than three. So it's going to lead to a frame shift. Two of these are common in India and I already told you about frame shift 89 and frame shift 41, 42. And then uh, there are a special group which are not inherited autosomal recessively unlike the other thalassemias, the overwhelming majority of thalassemias, but are dominantly inherited. So what happens here is that the mutation happens really um, far down the gene in exon 3 and this leads to the synthesis of truncated or elongated but highly unstable beta globin gene products and these gene products are going to be uh, precipitating within the uh, RBCs and adding to the precipitated alpha chains which of course still have nobody to uh, combine with and they will then be um, symptomatic even in the heterozygous state and that's why they are dominantly inherited and you can actually see the inclusion bodies. So with that, uh, now we're now heading into the last part of the class um, on the laboratory diagnosis of beta thalassemia. The genetic aspects that I mentioned are just a taste of the things that can go wrong. The beta globin has been a really instructive genes in terms of showing us what all range of changes can happen when a gene decides to undergo mutation or is forced to undergo mutation probably more likely. And there are many, many other things like poly A tail uh, things, there, sometimes rare things can be involved, uh, translocations, transacting factors, which I haven't gone into today because they're rarer than the uh, things that we discussed. Okay. So coming to laboratory diagnosis, so this is a diagnostic algorithm for the workup of thalassemia and hemoglobinopathies. It has to start with the clinical background and then we go on to the complete blood count. The complete blood count can be normal in persons who are carriers of alpha thalassemia and um, we'll discuss alpha thalassemia next time. But most of the times, if you have a microcytic, hypochromic kind of a blood picture and you're reasonably sure from the RDW and some indices that this is not iron deficiency, you need to go in for further testing. So there is something about thalassemic red cell indices which can uh, tip you off about the possibility of a thalassemia and I'll show it to you in a case study in a minute. The next test to be done typically is a hemoglobin HPLC. It mentions electrophoresis here because this slide was originally uh, meant to cover both thalassemia and hemoglobinopathies. But in the context of thalassemia, you need to go in for a technique that quantitates hemoglobin F and quantitates hemoglobin A2. And based on what you get from those um, results, if you have an hemoglobin A2 which is elevated and an F which is not markedly elevated, you are likely to have a beta thalassemia trait. If you have an A2 which is uh, normal range and an F which is may or may not be elevated, you have an alpha thalassemia trait. If you have an A2 which is elevated but also an F which is between 5 to 50 percent, then of course you need to correlate it clinically. You're looking at a beta thal intermedia or an NTDT. And HBH I'll skip and the variants I'll skip. And occasionally, if you're not clear after this, most cases will get clarified. But if you're still not clear, we'll need to go in for DNA analysis. So 
the HPLC and sometimes people can use uh, capillary electrophoresis are the two commonly used techniques for quantitation of uh, hemoglobin fractions. This is what a normal HPLC looks like. You have the numerical data on the top where, and you can see the A, F and A2 uh, percentages here. The A gets labeled as A0 because it can separate out P2 and P3 which are also uh, the um, uh, sub-fractions of adult hemoglobin. And then this you have the chromatogram which also you need to take a look at. So within the chromatogram you have windows which are designated by the software and you have various fractions coming in various windows which I'm sure there will be a class from someone somewhere. And you have a differential diagnosis for a region which is not covered in the windows. So, when you interpret HPLCs, you start with the clinical background, look at the age, look at the last transfusion. This is critical because the percentages of hemoglobin fractions are going to change if a patient has been transfused. We look at the CBC data and we look at the HPLC and finally, and then we, if required, go in for ancillary studies. So, there are some general rules for beta thalassemia. The normal range of hemoglobin A2 is between 2 to 3.3%. For diagnosis of beta thalassemia trait, we require a raised HPA2, but up to 9%. So, an uh, HPA2 between 4% to 9% is uh, elevated, consistent with beta thalassemia trait, as long as the indices are also supporting it. For a case of transfusion-dependent or even independent beta thalassemia, we need to have a raised hemoglobin F, which is usually uh, more than 45%, uh, so which is always more than 45% and usually more than 70 to 80%. The HbA level, of course, is going to vary depending on how much space F is occupying. And A2 levels can be are often increased but can also be normal or reduced. So let's just quickly roll through some cases. They're really uh, straightforward, really. This was a 20-year-old pregnant lady, and her hemoglobin was a little low, but then she's pregnant. Her RBC count is disproportionately high for her hemoglobin. and that, So uh, for a woman, uh, the uh, normal range for RBC count would be 3 to 5 million per microliter. She has microcytosis, normal range uh, 80 to 100, uh, hyperchromia, and uh, an RDW, which is slightly increased. So with this, we would say, summarize it as mildly reduced hemoglobin, microcytic hypochromic red cells, relative erythrocytosis, and a mildly increased RDW. So, what's going on? Well, we can try calculating the Menzer quotient, which is a simple one, MCV divided by RBC. This is 11.2. This is suggesting the thalassemia trait. So, uh, but the RDW is also elevated. So, one has to keep in mind that this is most likely with coexisting iron deficiency. She's pregnant, after all. And this is the HPLC. As we can see, her adult hemoglobin is okay, her F is okay, she's pregnant, and her A2 is 5.2%, so which is elevated. Remember, 4 to 9% is beta thalassemia trait. The HPLC has uh, no other abnormality other than the elevated A2. So, what we have here are um, just an elevation of A2 um, and the diagnosis is beta thalassemia trait. So, at this stage, we'll advise HPLC of her husband as well as that of her brothers and sisters because they are uh, likely to have a 50% chance of having thal trait as well. So, what happens if her husband's HPLC also shows beta thal trait? Well, then they have become a couple at risk, which means that they have a 25% chance of uh, having a beta thal major or a transfusion dependent beta thalassemia child. So, if a period of gestation is less than 20 or 24 weeks, depending on um, uh, how many doctors opinion you need, you can offer her prenatal diagnosis uh, if the couple wants it and you can offer that we will let you know if uh, your baby is affected. So moving on to case two. Now this is a one-year-old girl. She's um, a Sindhi girl from Gujarat and she has severe anemia and hepatosplenomegaly. Her hemoglobin is extremely low, 2.9 grams per deciliter. She's not been transfused so far, but she obviously desperately needs transfusions. And her RBC count is proportionately reduced. She has severe microcytosis and hypochromia. And look at her RDW, it's massively elevated. And this is her blood picture. Other than the microcytic hypochromic cells, the target cells, we can also see a very large number of erythroblasts. So, this was the HPLC which came and a one-year-old should have a fetal hemoglobin not more than 5%. Her fetal hemoglobin was 96%. And adult hemoglobin at 1% was virtually absent. So, what we're dealing with over here is 
मोस्ट लाइकली अ ट्रांसफ्यूजन डिपेंडेंट थैलेसीमिया और अ बिटा थैलेसीमिया मेजर एट दिस पॉइंट आई हैव टू रिमाइंड यू दैट यू मस्ट इन दिस केस ऑल्सो सजे एडवाइज पेरेंटल एच पी एल सीज एंड दैट्स बिकॉज आर केस सीम्स टू बी एन ओपन एंड शर्ट केस ऑफ थैल मेजर बट देर आर अदर डिफरेंशियल डायग्नोजीज फॉर कंडीशन विद इंक्रीज एच बी एफ सो दिस कैन हैपन इन नॉर्मल न्योनेट्स स्पेशली प्री मेच्योर बेबीज इन पर्सन विद होमोसाइगस बीटा थैलेसीमिया ऑफकोर्स दैट वी नो दैट्स वॉट आर चाइल्ड हैड बट ऑल्सो इन पीपल विद होमोसाइगस डेल्टा बीटा थैलेसीमिया वील टॉक अबाउट इट नेक्स्ट टाइम होमोसाइगस एच पी एफ एच अगेन समथिंग दैट विल कम अप लेटर एंड एनी ऑफ द कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ दीज थ्री सो पीपल हु आर डबल हेट्रोसाइगस फॉर से बीटा थैलेसीमिया एंड डेल्टा बीटा थैलेसीमिया बीटा थैलेसीमिया एंड एच पी एफ एच एंड सो ऑन quickly moving on to case 3 this was a 12 year old boy with intermittent jaundice and anemia so he's been unwell for a while he gets jaundice on and off and when they examined him they found splenomegaly but he's never received a transfusion so he's made it till 12 years right now his hemoglobin is low 6.3 but he's well he appears to not be in chf uh, people with chronic anemia tend to adjust their physical activity um, and compensate and there is microcytosis and hypochromia and the rdw is elevated so the next thing you do is order an hplc and this is what it showed the hemoglobin f was 31% the a2 was normal range and the adult hemoglobin was proportionately low and the hplc shows the increased f so together with these uh, findings the diagnosis is a clear cut case of non transfusion dependent beta thalassemia and this typically happens when the person inherits two beta plus plus mutations so uh, the causes of f in the range 15 to 45% will include non transfusion dependent thalassemia african type hpf trait and a thal major who's been transfused and you should never forget that maybe the history hasn't been provided we should in such a case it is imperative to do family uh, studies parental studies to confirm ti because they can also be acquired causes of increased hbf in our patient the clinical background is suggesting thalassemia intermedia okay so this is a question that i think i'll uh, come to uh, very quickly so what are the causes of non transfusion dependent thalassemia phenotype it can be because of homozygous or compound heterozygous uh, cases for mild which is beta plus or beta plus plus mutations or a severe mutation which is co inherited with either alpha thalassemia or a plus plus xmn1 polymorphism or hpfh or persons who are compound heterozygous for beta thalassemia and hbe or delta beta thalassemia with beta thalassemia or hpfh with beta thalassemia they will also have less transfusion requirement than uh, beta thalassemia major so we really um, so again at this point i'll take a pause and check with my host to see if there are any questions so far yes there is oh, okay tell me about it dr dr nilesh kapadia He's a very famous pathologist in Ahmedabad. He has put up a question. He says, "Why alpha thal are less? Is it related ah. to some genetic loci or locus it associated?" Uh, hi, Dr. Kapadia. Thanks. Uh, that's a great question because, um, and that's a very astute observation. So. Um, Uh, before i launch into the answer i must tell you that the frequency of alpha thalassemia trait in our country is actually higher or greater than the frequency of beta thal trait okay but paradoxically enough the uh, symptomatic forms of alpha thalassemia are seen much less commonly than beta thalassemia major and intermedia right and that's probably the reason why you asking the question so what happens is and i'll explain this in detail in the class on 18th is, is that in india we have a form of alpha thalassemia which is alpha plus thalassemia which means that on a particular chromosome 16 we have one allele uh, which one g, uh, gene uh, between alpha 2 and alpha 1 which is intact and the other one which is um, uh, uh, deleted alternatively you can have a mutation like uh, you can have a deletion like the, um, uh, the -3.7 kb deletion which still gives rise to a hybrid fusion product which has alpha gene producing activity So what does it mean? It means that a lot of Indians with alpha thalassemia trait who are going to be marrying other uh, South Asian. Sorry, can you hear me? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. 
So uh, unlike two people who uh, with beta thal trait who are marrying, they will reproducibly have uh, 25% of their kids if they have enough children. You'll see that frequency as thal major. On the other hand, if two people with alpha plus trait get married, they are not going to have a child with HBH disease or hemoglobin parts hydrox, which will come to attention. So I don't know if that makes sense because it's usually more helpful with a diagram, but uh, it's a clue um, if you want to explore it yourself, or maybe you could just log in and I'll address it uh, on the 18th. Uh, there is another question by Dr. Oshan Shreshta. He says, Hi, good Oshan. evening, sir. Can beta thalassemia also be acquired? Uh, hi, Oshan. Uh, he's a PGI alumnus and one with whom I've worked closely. Uh, oh, yes, it can. So, uh, the acquired forms of beta thalassemia are even rarer than the super rare acquired alpha thalassemia. Uh, for instance, I, I think uh, after many, many years, we recently got one more report. But, but yes, it can. And the mechanisms are, again, that in the face of genomic instability because of a hematological malignancy, um, really strange things can happen with the genome. Yeah. There are no more questions. We can go ahead. Right. So I'm just thinking. Um, some part of today's talk, I think I'll move into the next one because alpha thalassemias per se are less. Um, so just bear with me for maybe another five or ten minutes. Uh, no, okay. Yeah. 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 Please go ahead. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. We are enjoying it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll now launch into genetic diagnosis. So, so far what we've looked at is the pathogenesis and the uh, type of mutations and the uh, defects that uh, can go wrong. But uh, we can, uh, but we must as pathologists be familiar with what you do if you're faced with a patient whose HPLC is suggesting thalassemia. So, uh, for that, it's really helpful that in India, the mutations which are common are really common. By which I mean that if you take the first five mutations in this list and you test for them, you would have covered more than 90% of the thalassemic alleles that you're going to encounter in any part of the country. And the a clear winner in terms of frequency across groups other than immigrants is the IVS15G2C, which we saw was a splice site mutation, followed closely by, not very closely, followed remotely by 619 base pair deletion, and then the um, another splice site and two frame shifts, the codon 89 and 4142. So with this background, uh, let's see how laboratories can go about detecting these. But before we detect these, first let's see if it's required. So genetic diagnosis, remember, is not always indicated in thalassemia. It is indicated mostly in a patient who's transfusion dependent. So you have a child who by the time is, uh, he's, he or she is referred to you is one and a half years of age. He, they are on their sixth transfusion and they are not going to ever go off transfusions. Both their parents are beta thalassemia trait. So you want, uh, want to confirm whether they are uh, thal major and for that you need to do a DNA analysis. Another big group in bigger centers has now become prenatal diagnosis. So if a couple has already had a thal major baby or they are, they've found out during uh, uh, preconceptional uh, testing that uh, or uh, prenatal uh, antenatal testing that they are both thal traits, they might want to know if the baby is uh, going to be a thal major. Well, then you need to do a molecular test because HPLC won't help in an in utero stage. And then uh, another group sometimes is patients who have clinically unclear diagnosis and where other DDs have not been excluded. So let me just explain this. Occasionally you'll have a child who's at 8 months of age or 10 months of age with a high F and hepatosplenomegaly and anemia and you will have both his parents being beta thal trait. But remember that two beta thal traits at the end of the day have a 25% chance of having a child who's uh, in every pregnancy of having a child who's thal major. So that doesn't clinch the diagnosis. They're being Thal trait doesn't clinch the diagnosis for the uh, kiddo, right? So what you need to, uh, in such a situation, suppose the clinician says, you know, I haven't really ruled out JMML because HBF can go up there and they can have hepatosplenomegaly and failure to thrive. So then you'll have to say, fine, then I'll have to do the beta thal mutations. So with this background, we'll have, once we decide that we need to do the test, what are the techniques that we need to uh, um, put in practice? So for beta thalassemia, and any alpha or beta variant which occurs due to point mutations, one of the most high yield systems is something called the Amplification Refractory Mutation System PCR or ARMS PCR. 
uh, you can also if you can design uh, find a ref uh, restriction enzyme that cle uh, cleaves uh, uh, at the relevant site or very close to it design a pcr restriction fragment length polymorphism there is a cost effective strategy which can be multiplexed very easily called reverse dot plot hybridization and then as uh, laboratories and uh, patients both get more technically advanced and richer respectively we can straight away go in for sanger sequencing which is also good for small sized uh, problems Alpha thalassemia, just a sneak peek, uh, uh, is often caused by deletions. So you need to have another set of uh, weapons in your armamentarium: gap PCR or multiplex ligation dependent um, probe amplification. So looking first quickly at reverse dot plot hybridization, this is um, done by many centers, though not. Um, PGI uh, because of uh, some robustness issues, but the principle here is that we design uh, uh, a nylon membrane onto which probes for different mutations, DNA, oligonucleotide probes are uh, immobilized. And once we have a membrane which look, looks like this thing over here, we take and whenever a patient comes, you can make these membranes in bulk and keep them. So whenever a patient comes, you take that person's genomic DNA, amplify it using biotinylate. Later, biotin labeled uh, primers so that you'll be able to detect them later uh, through fluorescence and hybridize them to the membrane strip here. And in each of these, sorry, not fluorescence, but uh, the strip in biotin reaction. Uh, so, in each of these strips, uh, you will have to set up two sets of combinations. So, you have IVS15, this is the probe for the wild type sequence, and this had the probe for the mutant sequence. Uh, frame shift 89, wild type mutant, and so on and so forth. So, uh, what we will then do is that once we have the strip, we're going to hybridize our geno patient's genomic DNA to this, and then look for whether, then do a lot of washing and see whether the hybrid hybridization occurred or not. So in persons who don't have a particular mutation, you are going to get just the spot in the wild type region, right? And nothing in the mutant. But if for the mutations which the patient is possessing, you will get a spot in the mutant region as well uh, or uh, just there. So because this person hybridized with the wild type as well as the mutant probes, we know that he, this person is heterozygous for frame shift 89 and similar situation for IVS11, so heterozygous for this. So we are probably looking at a beta naught, beta naught thal major child yeah and the other uh, mutations were absent so this is actually a real life example and uh, in each of these strips the uh, panel the, the row on the top are the wild type sequences probes and the one on the bottom is the uh, mutant probes so this first sample is normal for all of these uh, mutations that were tested this one uh, I think, yeah. So, because we designed this strip ourselves, we know that here we had bio, uh, put the biotinylated probe for the um, uh, sickle hemoglobin in this particular row. We mass produced these strips ad in advance, okay, before the patient came. So, this patient amplified with both wild type and hetero uh, mutant sickle, so S trait. This one is IVS15 heterozygous. Here, what's happening is that IVS15 has amplified, but the wild type primer for IVS15 has not amplified. So this person is homozygous. You could ask me, you know, why are these uh, are all, why are these also missing? Is this a technical error? No, these are uh, uh, mutations which are very close to the IVS15. So we already know from our past experience with this reverse dot dot that whenever we get the IVS15, these spots are not going to come. So in a way, it's like a quality control. And um, so. Um, this is uh, because we know that here we put in the codon 30. Uh, this is the uh, this patient is heterozygous for codon 30 mutation. Coming on now to uh, amplification refractory mutation system, which is the system that we use at PGI. This is a form of an allele specific PCR, but not just any allele specific PCR, it's a very special one. And why? Because in this we have two sets of primers, a mutant and a wild type primer. And these primers I, I, are identical to each other, except that they will differ only at a three prime terminal base. And we know this makes it obvious that we have we can only use this in a single base pair uh, change uh, substitution that's happening. So basically the primer, uh, the mutant primer has a mismatch with the wild type sequence but a match with the mutant sequence at the three prime end. And to make it specific, sometimes you can introduce other changes as well. 
So how does it work? When we put in, so we have two primers, so we normally set up two different tubes. When we put in the normal primer, if the patient has the, the normal allele, it is going to bind perfectly and the three prime end binding is extremely essential for a proper PCR reaction. So you are going to get a product, the amplification will happen. On the other hand, if the patient has the mutation and we have put in the other primer, the wild type primer, this is not going to bind. So with the wild type primer, you will, uh, so actually in this particular example, this DNA is again the wild type DNA and when we put in the mutant primer, which instead of an A has a C at this 3 prime end, there is going to be no uh, uh, complementarity and then the uh, uh, DNA dependent RNA polymerase is not going to amplify the subsequent part of the um, uh, segment. So this is what it, the gel actually looks like. We've got two but different PCR reactions. This one, this is a control band. So again, just going back. So we, the, this is a very beautifully or, or cleverly designed PCR because a control primer is put in within the sequences, and there's another control uh, primer, the um, con, uh, the opposite primer to this that is going to amplify within this area as well. So because this, we are ultimately going to be looking for the presence or absence of this particular band. So the control band has to come every time. Each lane ref is a different PCR reaction. So for codon 8.9, when we put in the mutant primer, we got the mutant uh, product. But with the wild type primer, we got no product. So we can say that this particular patient is um, heterozygous, uh, sorry, homozygous for the codon 8.9 mutation. And this is probably uh, another uh, primer because you can see that the length is different. We compare them against the, um, uh, the ladder, the base pair ladder here. So this is uh, a gel showing the five common mutations by ARMS PCR. Um, they have to be done separately, but you can try multiplexing a few of them. So this is the IVS15. Most uh, mo these are all mutant primers, uh, not in pairs. Frame shift eight nine, a different size product. Cap plus one, IVS11. This is the PhiX marker. Frame shift forty one forty two, IVS15, and the six one nine BPD uh, mutant uh, deletion. So you could ask me that six one nine BPD is not a single base pair deletion, right? It's it's a 619 base pair uh, deletion. It's not a substitution or a missense mutation. So how does how do you use ARMS PCR for this? Well, what happens is, and again, um, the uh, I should say the sheer innovativeness of the person who designed this comes becomes obvious. The uh, control band, if the 619 base pair deletion has happened, becomes much shorter. It actually starts working like a gap PCR. So because we got the usual control band as well as the 619 BPD band, regardless of whichever primers we put in, remember, because the control primers were the same for all of these tubes, right? So because we got these, uh, had any of these samples also had the 609 BPD, we would have got this additional band over here. So we can say that this, the whoever's DNA was in this lane is heterozygous for the 609 BPD. On one part, the, the deletion is not there, but on the other allele, the deletion has happened. I hope that's clear. And then uh, we're really drawing towards the end now. This is an example of an RFLP, uh, the restriction fragment length polymorphism. The, it's a universal technique. So, I'll, uh, so suffice to say we amplify a region, then we use a restriction enzyme to either cut or not cut the PCR product depending on what is the motif that the restriction enzyme is recognizing. And then we simply run the fragments after digestion on a gel to see uh, the sizes obtained. And this is an example of PCR RFLP of the, I told you about the XMN1 G gamma polymorphism, which influences HBF levels. So the XMN1 is actually an enzyme and in uh, persons who have the wild type, which is the minus minus genotype, the enzyme is not going to cut the amplified band. When we uh, over uh, when we uh, expose this band to the XMN1 uh, restriction enzyme. On the other hand, if the person ha has a plus plus genotype, then he has uh, the polymorphism on both alleles, so we'll get two uh, smaller bands. And if a person has plus on one allele and minus on the other, he'll get a band uh, of the uh, wild type as well as the bands of the polymorphic. So we know that this person is heterozygous. He has both these two kinds of patterns.
um, this is another PCR RFLP for HBD Punjab. In this one, there is a loss of restriction. Uh, uh, there's a um, loss of restriction site. So the normal has two smaller bands, and the homozygous uh, person is going to have a single band which didn't get cleaved by the uh, EcoR one. More and more labs are now using Sanger sequencing. This is a chain termination uh, kind of reaction where in addition to the uh, deoxynucleotides, we add differently labeled dideoxynucleotides as well. And depending on where this is happening randomly, the incorporation of that dideoxynucleotide happens, the chain is going to get terminated. And uh, while we're running a PCR reaction, the sequencing PCR, so to speak. And then all we have to do is electrophorese these products they are all one, there is a very high resolution electrophoresis, they are, they are going to see the, um, uh, depending, so 1, 2, 3, 4 and we will get the sequence. So this is what a Sanger sequence looks like. Let me show you an example here. This person is heterozygous, there is a, a G and a C which got detected in this area. Um, this person has a frame shift mutation because the sequence is clean till here, but subsequently it's got garbled. So the um, yeah. so what we do in uh, sequencing PCR is we put in only the forward primer or only the reverse primer. So we're just seeing either the plus strand of both the alleles or the minus strand of both the alleles. If they match, then we get a clean sequence with just the mismatch here. But in case a frame shift has happened in either of the alleles, then the sequence will not overlap and a gobbling is going to happen. So uh, I think this is going to be my last slide for today. When you uh, look at beta thal major versus intermedia at a genetic level, this is a thesis by Amarjot Kaur, uh, Dr. Amarjot, who is our senior resident now. So this is the data that she got. So look at the layout of mutations. This is a three-year study. and. When we look at thal major or transfusion dependent thalassemia, we get the top five that we talked about earlier. IVS15, 609 BPD, frameshift89, IVS11 and frameshift4142. These are the commonest mutations. When we look at thal intermedia or non-transfusion dependent thalassemia, the situation changes. The top mutation becomes minus 88 C2T. A new entrant comes into the top five, which is cap plus one. This was at number eight in the trans thal major list. And obviously everybody else has to move down. The IVS11 now becomes, out of the five commonest, it becomes the second most common in the NTDT. And that's because the IVS11 is often associated with a, um, with a with an XMN1 plus plus kind of a genotype. These are closely inherited. IVS15 is still there, but it's now relegated to number three. And then we've got the others. And uh, another point that can be made from this slide is that mutations can remain unidentified, uh, especially in NTDT uh, in a uh, proportion of patients. So there are a few pitfalls of molecular techniques. Deletions are not detected by both endpoint PCRs as well as Sanger sequencing, so be careful. Large deletions may false, uh, and if they are present, along with something, uh, a point mutation on a contralateral allele, will end up looking as if they are homozygous for the opposite lesion if you have done Sanger sequencing or endpoint PCRs. You can design the best primers, but if there is a naturally occurring polymorphism in your patient at the point where the primer is binding or the restriction enzyme is binding, then the PCR is going to give you an opposite result to what you expect because these are all based on whether your primer or RE found their site or didn't find it. And the, the globin genes overlap extensively because of similar uh, evolutionary origins. So one has to be careful, especially regarding alpha globin gene sequencing data. So, um, with, I'll just walk you through my conclusions. Quantitative disorders of the globin chains are relatively common. They are usually clinically severe in the homozygous state. They are potentially preventable by timely carrier detection and offering prenatal diagnosis to the affected couples at risk. Diagnosis of beta thalassemia trait can be done using hemogram data and HbA2 quantitation and detection of increased hemoglobin F along with typical blood counts and smear findings with judicious use of parental studies and molecular genetics can help diagnose transfusion dependent and non-transfusion dependent thalassemias. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent presentation. Thank uh, you. There is a question or rather a continuation of the question by Dr. Nilesh Kapadia. Uh, 
He says alpha beta ratio is maintained normally, but how in compound heterozygous thalassemia is it maintained? Which compound, the next part of it is which compound heterozygous are beneficial or which ones are more severe? Um, could you just repeat the first part? I, the alpha -beta I, ratio, I yeah. He says alpha beta ratio is maintained normally, but how in compound heterozygous thal is it maintained? Not really. I mean, I don't know why you'd say that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not getting the, the wordings of it. Uh, Let me, uh, okay, please go on. Yeah. The next I part of it, yeah. which compound heterozygous thal are beneficial? And which ones are more severe? Please explain why. Okay. So uh, let me try and answer this as I understand it. Um, but in case I'm wrong, then um, Dr. Kapadia, please just feel free to call me up or write to me um, or put it in the chat box. So the commonest compound heterozygous state in India, which is clinically very relevant, is uh, HBE beta thalassemia. Right, so one allele has HBE, which is um, uh, codon 26, and the other one has any of these beta naught, let's say, mutations. So those patients are going to be symptomatic because the alpha beta globin ratio is not maintained, because uh, the uh, amount of uh, you know the E chain can bind alpha, but it's still half the other allele. The thalassemic allele is producing nothing. So there is an excess of alpha chains and which is why those patients will be symptomatic with thal intermedia. Urine calcutta, so I'm sure you know better than me that the heterogeneity, sorry, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead, sorry. That uh, this, this, these E beta can have a whole host of heterogeneities simply because they can inherit other things as well. And that's probably what you're asking in the second part. So let me put it this way. So if somebody's got two beta naught mutations, but at the same time was lucky enough to co-inherit uh, XMN1 plus plus genotype and uh, let's say an HBH disease, three alpha chain deletions, then that lucky person is going to be thal intermedia because the, the uh, many things get taken care of. On the other hand, if somebody has two mild mutations, but also inherits... Um, but not even that, somebody has one mutation, a beta thalassemia trait, but co-inherits alpha triplications or quadruplications, those patients can sometimes get into trouble when in times of hematological stress, you know, during pregnancy, the hemoglobins can really drop or the hemoglobin F can go up because, again, the balance uh, went all right. So I would say the beneficial uh, combinations are the ones which increase either hemoglobin, which either increase hemoglobin F or reduce the alpha workload. Alpha urge LE load. Uh, the next part of his question is how to work up in such cases to diagnose it? What yeah. is the diagnostic modality? <laughs> that, that's again a great question and uh, you know the great questions often don't have very straightforward answers so uh, I would suggest uh, I mean, what we do is we work our way through the modifiers um, so we first ascertain the beta globin defects and then we go in for XMN1 plus uh, XMN1 status, the alpha deletions and the alpha triplications. So there's a multiplex PCR for alpha, which I'll talk about next time. And you can screen for eight of them in one go, the deletions. And you can again multiplex the triplications and look for 3.7 and 4.2 deletion uh, kilo base pair deletions in one PCR. So till here it's fairly reasonably quick and cost effective um, because these you know the endpoint PCRs are not so. Uh, uh, expensive but if they're still unexplained and then you have to start thinking and luckily those patients are very few but you have to start thinking about transacting factors you know uh, somebody has thal intermedia but the beta allele uh, is looking okay then you need to think about xmn1 and klf and uh, sorry not xmn1 but klf bcl 11a those sort of things so it's they really do behave like polygenic disorders Right, Dr. Nilesh Chapadia has a comment. He says it's a very nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Indeed, a very nice presentation, very nicely explained and very extensively done up. We'll be eagerly waiting for the part two of it. Thank you, sir. It's very gratifying that you liked it. Right. I must acknowledge my. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I go? Please. So I must acknowledge. Down, like, 
Okay, uh, yeah, that's because. So uh, I must acknowledge the uh, constant help and support of my uh, boss and uh, colleague and friend, Professor Rina Das, uh, whom I'm sure many of the listeners know, and uh, as a very friendly and approachable phenomenology um, uh, uh, faculty at. PGI. Uh, a lot of this uh, data and the work and the lab standardization has been Madam's uh, efforts over the decades, really, and and she is the real expert. Um, yes, yeah, so I have to get say that, and we have a wonderful, wonderful team of technicians who, who help us with this, both the HPLC and the molecular. Great. Right. Thank you, Dr. Prashant Sharma, for such a wonderful presentation we'll be looking forward to the next session right till then take care good night bye bye thank you so nice having you thank you sir take care bye bye good thank night you sir bye. it was a pleasure being here yeah good night right. same here thank you bye yeah.